So it's my uh, great pleasure to um, introduce you to Sakura Christmas uh, from Bodon College, whom I've been working uh, tirelessly to, to get here uh, to give a talk on her very interesting research. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Bodine College uh, in Maine, uh, and uh, she took her PhD at Harvard University in 2016 with a dissertation entitled The Cartographic Step Mapping Environment and Ethnicity uh, in Japan's Imperial Borderlands. Um, the title of today's talk uh, will be, as um, you notice, know, Imperial Japan and the Nature of Borders in Occupied Inner Mongolia. And I think this is a really interesting work that combines both emerging trends in environmental history, but also uh, really taking this transnational turn seriously, talking about the, uh, the, the state uh, beyond uh, the nation state and inserting Inner Mongolia into uh, the Japanese colonial empire. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will gonna uh, leave the uh, speaker to um, uh, Sakura and uh, give her a heartfelt welcome. So uh, I wanted to first uh, to express my thanks to the Center for Japanese Studies uh, for inviting me to campus today, uh, to Park Hassel uh, for hosting my visit, uh, and to uh, Barbara Kinzer and the rest of the staff uh, for making my travel arrangements. Um, this is my first time in Michigan, I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here. Uh, so my talk today uh, is titled Imperial Japan and the Nature of Borders in Occupied Inner Mongolia. And uh, it draws from uh, three chapters of my book manuscript, uh, which examines how Imperial Japan uh, demarcated an autonomous province uh, in Eastern Inner Mongolia, uh, which was then uh, a part of uh, the client state of Manchukuo. Uh, so to introduce this history, uh, however, I actually have to begin uh, with China, which I realize is not the geographic area of focus for the Center for Japanese Studies, but uh, bear with me. Um, so China, okay. So uh, one cornerstone of uh, the legitimacy of the People's Republic of China, uh, which was founded in 1949, uh, is the autonomous region system. Uh, China today features uh, five autonomous regions. Uh, so we have uh, Inner Mongolia, uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, Guangxi, and Ningxia, uh, and uh, dozens of other smaller um, autonomous counties. And these uh, special areas, uh, they recognize um, concentrations of ethnic minorities um, and can therefore form uh, their own governments uh, and have some legal exceptions. And in the past, uh, these legal exceptions included families uh, having more than one child or having a bilingual language uh, policy. Uh, over the past several centuries, uh, the border areas that would become uh, these autonomous regions, uh, they've been both included and excluded uh, from the geo body that we know today as China. Um, and the boundaries of China today, uh, as you see from this map, uh, they roughly correspond to a mid uh, 18th century expansion um, of the Qing Empire, uh, with the exception of Mongolia uh, <laughs> right here blacked out. Uh, so, um, one of the foundational myths of, of the People's Republic of China um, is that uh, it was Mao Zedong uh, and the communists who uh, first realized when they went on the long march uh, that they needed to broker uh, this alliance with ethnic minorities uh, on the periphery uh, because they wanted to retain uh, those border territories, that they needed to take the demands of ethnic minorities uh, very seriously. Uh, and so Mao, uh, he, he drew from models of autonomous regions uh, from the Soviet Union, uh, which similarly had to manage um, this kind of problem uh, in its border regions, uh, both in Central Asia uh, and in Siberia. So um, my talk today um, actually shows an alternate narrative. Uh, the idea for the first autonomous region uh, didn't simply just come from Mao's long march or from these Soviet models, um, but also from uh, Japanese imperialism uh, in itself. And uh, in particular, I'm going to focus uh, today on uh, the Japanese demarcation of a province um, in Manchukuo in the early 1930s um, and how that actually set a precedent for um, 
uh, the first autonomous region, uh, which would become Inner Mongolia, uh, founded in 1947, uh, which was actually two years before the People's Republic of China um, had come into existence. So uh, when Japan invaded uh, northeastern China in 1931, um, as many of you are probably aware, um, it set up the client state of Manchukuo. Uh, Manchukuo was an experiment uh, in high uh, modernism. Uh, and what really um, made it stand out, of course, um, was that Manchukuo uh, featured this multi-ethnic uh, population, uh, unlike most of other uh, Japan's um, territorial acquisitions. It wasn't just the colonizer and the colonized. It was the colonizer and a bunch of different colonized peoples. Uh, and so to, to manage and to supposedly celebrate uh, this diversity, uh, Japanese authorities uh, propagated the ide ideology of um, the harmony um, of the five races. Uh, so as we can see from this particular postcard, uh, these were you know, Koreans, uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese, and sometimes this is also coded as Manchu, um, Russians, uh, and of course, uh, Mongols. And uh, the subject of today's talk really deals with the Japanese-Mongol relationship here. So um, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, this is a South Manchuria railway poster um, of a Hauk Mongol woman, uh, her traditional hairdress. Uh, this is, you know, served as the inspiration for Queen Amidala in, in Star Wars. So this is your pop culture reference for today. It's the only thing you have to remember from this talk. Uh, but um, in, in reality, of course, um, these relations were neither harmonious um, and they weren't just five races, right? Um, so keeping the peace in this multi-ethnic state um, was no easy feat. Uh, Japan had inherited a very long history of ethnic tension uh, in the region, and one of the most fraught areas um, was this internal borderland in the northwest um, of, of the client state. So what we're looking at here is this particular shaded uh, region, and of course um, the autonomous province will end up being in this, this general area. Uh, so uh, historically, um, Manchuria uh, was an area um, which the Qing Empire had kept uh, very sparsely populated uh, with various indigenous peoples. Uh, but starting in the mid 18th century and then really only accelerating in the late 19th century, uh, Chinese migration really pushed into this territory um, as a form of uh, settler colonialism. And um, you know, the Chinese population uh, versus the indigenous population, uh, they had fundamentally very different relationships uh, to the land, right? Um, the Chinese who first settled there, they were you know, traveling merchants, uh, sedentary farmers, uh, and the Mongols uh, were nomadic herders on the steppe, uh, but some of them did farm on the side uh, as well, but they, that wasn't their primary occupation. Uh, and then there were others like the Orochon uh, that lived up into the mountains in this area, uh, who were hunter-gatherers. Uh, By the early 20th century, um, ethnic riots and revolts uh, regularly erupted uh, between Chinese and Mongols over this issue of land reclamation. So as Chinese um, farmers were converting the steppe into farmland and Mongols uh, found themselves on increasingly smaller pastures for their herds of sheep, and horses and cows and goats. Um, this this um, erupted or culminated with um, one of the largest Mongolian revolts over land rights, uh, which took place uh, in 1929 um, in this part of the country right here, um, in the Horshin grasslands. Uh, and uh, this, this revolt left um, 2,000 people dead, uh, several thousands more women and children um, who migrated westward uh, in the middle of winter uh, because of um, the violence. So uh, because of these revolts, right, um, Japanese authorities in Manchukuo, I mean, they were coming in literally two years after uh, this particular um, incident. Uh, because of these revolts, uh, the Japanese became really convinced that they needed to mark out this internal border um, in the zone of mixed settlement. And uh, they needed to separate out the Mongols uh, from the Chinese. Uh, and so you can kind of get a sense of this is the border right here, and the borderlands are this, this sort of bluish area here uh, from a map um, in 1939. So um, the revolts were, you know, a proximate cause for marking out this internal border. Uh, but we also have to keep in mind um, a convergence of other three um, larger like, contextual factors. Uh, number one, 
the Wilsonian moment uh, after World War I uh, fundamentally altered uh, Japanese justifications for imperial expansion uh, throughout East Asia. Uh, so there was this new order of national self-determination. And so Inner Mongolia, um, like China and like Korea, uh, campaigned for independence um, governance into the 1920s. And so the autonomous region um, or the autonomous province, um, when it came into being, it, it represented this compromise uh, for Mongols who were unable to gain complete sovereignty uh, under this, this Wilsonian moment. Uh, number two, uh, the Mongol territories of Manchukuo, as you could tell from the maps, uh, these were some of the most remote holdings of the Japanese empire uh, to date. So um, in this particular you know, frontier space, uh, Japanese control really began to unravel uh, at the fringes. And that really opened up this possibility for uh, new kinds of political relationships, uh, for new kinds of you know, territorial experiments, uh, such as this, this autonomous province. And um, within this autonomous province, uh, Japanese occupiers were helping realize uh, really this, this very um, conservative vision of pastoralism by uh, the Mongol elites who wanted to, to go back to the so-called old ways of life. Uh, and then finally, of course, um, uh, Japanese authorities were uh, very much invested in legitimizing this, this regime, which is a client state, um, and they had to do so um, in a way uh, that Prasenjit Dwara has called uh, primitive authenticity. And so what does this primitive authenticity mean? Um, so uh, Japanese uh, justified their occupation in Manchukuo um, basically um, because of this, this supposal, uh, supposed ancestral connection between Japanese uh, and the um, indigenous peoples of, of Manchuria and Mongolia. Uh, and so in order to maintain that authentic connection, that they were interested in, in preserving culturally some aspects of Mongol and Tungusic minorities. Uh, so as Duara writes, uh, the Japanese held a quote, yearning to see their true self in the primitive through a glass uh, darkly. Um, as a result, uh, the Japanese technocrats that were involved in this project, uh, they sought to limit um, what they saw as this, this loss of traditional lifeways um, as a result of modernization. And they collaborated uh, with Mongol elites uh, to pursue really radical um, solutions. Uh, and these are radical solutions in population transfers, uh, which we'll see, and environmental planning uh, in order to demarcate this border. Um, and this border, it's important because it continues to define uh, the eastern limit of what is the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region to this day. So my talk today, um, I'm going to explain uh, the, the process and the consequences of uh, the border demarcation, uh, both, both ethnically uh, and environmentally. Uh, in 1932, uh, this new border uh, left several thousand Mongols on, out, on the outside of the autonomous province. Uh, this led to more riots, uh, population transfers, um, and forced um, relocation. Uh, and then um, the Japanese administration sought to make um, the autonomous province itself uh, a pastoral reserve. Uh, and they did this uh, by introducing new plant and animal species. Um, and their hope was ultimately to uh, increase uh, economic productivity. Uh, now, outside of the province, uh, the uh, Japanese administration actually went in the opposite direction, right? So they continued to encourage um, agriculture by Chinese farmers uh, who cleared away the land uh, for soybeans, amongst other crops. And because the soybeans um, were being uh, shipped elsewhere in the empire uh, and beyond, um, this particular industry really stripped the soil of um, its nutrients. Uh, and in particular, uh, it stripped the soil of selenium, which um, uh, was a specific geological profile of, of these, these former Mongolian territories. So um, as a result of this very intensive agriculture that was taking place, uh, Chinese farmers um, began to develop uh, selenium, selenium deficiency disorders, um, and that led to uh, um, hundreds of deaths um, along the, the provincial border. Uh, so as you can tell from both uh, my talk today, uh, and then hopefully from the larger book project as it's come into being. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to document uh, the environmental footprint um, of the Japanese empire. 
And so much of um, the environmental history of Japan, uh, it tends to frame nature within uh, national bounds. Uh, but this perspective has um, really prevented us from seeing um, the extractive economies uh, that Japan was developing through you know, the expansion of its empire. Uh, and of course, those extractive economies were really necessary for um, the modernization of, of the nation state um, and of the imperial center. Uh, so um, situating the Mongolian territories um, at the very center, right? We're going to Inner Mongolia away from Japan. Um, when we situate it at the center of this um, environmental transformation, we really begin to see what those um, ecological costs of imperialism uh, look like. So. Uh, after the 1931 invasion, uh, the Japanese military had no uh, Mongol specialists in the officer corps. And um, so what this meant was that this was an opportunity for a man named Kikutake Jitsuzo. Uh, he, um, they, they turned to this railroad employee um, who, um, to, to help them figure out uh, what exactly to do with this Mongolian population in the northwestern part of the country. Uh, Kikutake, he uh, studied Mongolian at the uh, Tokyo University of Foreign Languages. Uh, he had been living in the Mongolian territories for almost a decade by this point, uh, and he first worked as an agent uh, for Mitsui, um, and then as a researcher for the South Manchuria Railway Company. Um, as you can see from um, the image to your right, uh, he drafted uh, the first plan uh, for an autonomous province, um, and he did this in collaboration with his connections uh, amongst uh, the Mongol elites. Uh, and together, they, they named this province um, Hyangan uh, province. In Japanese, this is Koan Shou, and in Chinese, this is Xing An Sheng. Uh, and Hyangan is, was named after the mountain range within this province. Um, it means ridge in Mongolian. Um, and the idea here is that the name Hyangan kind of recognized that there were more than just Mongolians living in this area. Uh, otherwise, they would just name this place Inner Mongolia, right? So, so, so this was a new name, right? Um, and uh, if we uh, take a look at this map, OK, not this one. Here we go, this one. Uh, establishing this province really involved a very complicated set of politics um, to convince various indigenous groups, um, various Mongolian territories that historically didn't really belong together to really band together in this one administrative uh, unit. Uh, so in the north, so up in this area in the Hurumbur region, um, we have Halkh uh, Mongols, um, Barag, Oirat, uh, Buryat Mongols. Um, we also have Tungusic peoples like the Orochon, uh, uh, the Yakut, uh, the Evenk uh, towards the south in this area right here. Um, we have um, Horchen, Dorbet, and, and, and Gorlos Mongols. Uh, out here we have the Harachin Mongols. And then over on the east by the uh, Nanjiang River, um, there were Daur Mongols um, and Orochon also living there. So um, the, the point is all of these different little pods are there to represent where these various ethnic minorities were living uh, during this time and, and why this was so complicated to bring uh, these people together into this, this one autonomous region. Um, so eventually, over the course of um, various negotiations, uh, the Mongols uh, and the Japanese, they, they created this borderline in 1932. Um, and this borderline was really based on uh, geographic features of the land and the current demographics uh, in 1932. Uh, so Kikutake, he drew a line, let's see, here we go. He drew a line that really began with the, the ridge, or the peaks of the Hyangan Mountains up here. And then as he got down here, um, he um, uh, drew the border so that it was following the Nanjiang River uh, down this way. Um, and then along um, this, this 13th century wall that was built to keep out the Mongols. Um, and then this is where he began to run into problems. And so the, the lines around here get very messy. This is where the Horchen um, Mongols uh, kind of revolted back in 1929. And so, so in order to deal with how to, to create this border, um, Kikutake, he uh, distributed local surveys um, to, to these um, governments um, to determine what the current population breakdown uh, was and what the land usage looked like in these areas. Uh, so if the majority of the population was Chinese and agrarian, uh, then Kikutake would cut those places out of the, the autonomous province. 
Uh, and then if the majority of the population was Mongol, uh, Mongolian or, and pastoral, um, then Kikutake would include it uh, within um, the new province. So that's why this line gets so messy in this area. And then in the south right here, he used the uh, Shiramoran River as the, the demarcation line. So um, this new border, uh, it caused a significant resentment amongst the Mongol elites who owned uh, all of this territory here that you see that's shaded uh, because they basically lost um, over a third of their ancestral land in just one fell swoop. It's gone, right? Uh, and um, they, they still harbored this chance that, you know, perhaps at some point in the future, uh, they could recover uh, these regions, um, but it would never come to pass. And this line is more or less uh, the current eastern boundary of the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region uh, today. Uh, and besides the Mongols, uh, the Chinese residents were also very dissatisfied. Um, in fact, they were, they were alarmed. And um, the riots took place in five different counties along the border from 1932 to 1933. Um, and uh, Kikitake and other Japanese authorities had to recalibrate the border um, to, 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 um, because they were you know, afraid of further violence. Uh, and then in the end, these areas were excluded um, out of uh, the province. Um, so as much as Kikutake um, believed that he could match uh, the, the plans on, his, on paper to the lived reality of the borderlands, um, the demarcation that you see here ultimately split the Mongolian population in half. Uh, 500,000 people were on one side of the border. Um, 500,000 people were on the other side of the border. Um, and so um, it was really difficult to, to, to come up with a solution um, that wouldn't you know, result in, in significant violence uh, for the country. Um, and so um, to, to you know, align a little bit what the reality of the borderlands looked like at this time to you know, the, the grand scale schemes on the map, um, these ideals on the map, um, various Mongol leaders um, actually spearheaded uh, this program uh, to fund families living outside of the province, so out here, um, to move them uh, back within its bounds. Um, and this, this was a trip uh, that could sometimes span a few hundred miles. And the reason why uh, they wanted to encourage these Mongols to move um, as um, this one dour Mongol, um, Orunchun, uh, uh, this, this governor said, um, he said that, quote, with the reclamation of um, the wastelands in the Republican period, uh, the Mongols in this area, uh, in this, this borderland area, they've lost their places to hunt and herd and have no fixed property or occupation. They live in mixed areas where the Han and their customs and dispositions have become jumbled up. And this was a real problem to have jumbled up customs, right? Uh, and so, um, what we see here uh, is that there is this, this systematic clearing out of Mongols um, from their hereditary lands. So um, this particular move right here. OK, so um, the Pale of Settlement moved further west. Um, and in 1933, uh, the Japanese authorities sponsored about um, 1,400 families, uh, roughly 7,000 people. Uh, to migrate into Kyangan province. Uh, and then seven years later, in 1940, um, they sponsored another population transfer of about 7,000 people. And the hope was that from 1943 to 1948, Kyangan um, province would uh, sponsor the relocation of um, 1,000 Mongol families, uh, which is about 5,000 people, um, every year to cross over the Nanjiang River uh, and then redistribute them for housing in various um, locations within the province. Um, this ambitious program, I haven't really been able to find much evidence of it you know, ultimately taking place after 1943. And so um, we're left to assume that uh, it likely collapsed with the escalation of uh, the Pacific War. Um, so oral history accounts um, suggest that um, on the ground, these were actually not voluntary moves um, by uh, Mongol households. Um, government agents, they recruited communities under false pretenses, um, or they just made them move outright uh, without any choice. Uh, and we know that some of these new settlements, the migrants um, coming out of the province um, into the province, uh, they, uh, these settlements really stood on the brink of failure for many years, and it took a long time for them to be, become you know, self-sufficient um, and sustaining themselves.
Now, um, after demarcating uh, Hyangan province, uh, Kikutake Jitsuzo uh, wanted to revert as much of the farmland uh, in this area uh, as possible back into pasture. Um, and he wrote that he wanted to develop, quote, develop the livestock industry according to the intrinsic capabilities of the Mongols, since it is their, their will to live has atrophied due to the sudden agricultural invasion of the Han Chinese. Um, and so he advocated very frequently uh, in his proposals and writings uh, for maintaining the, uh, quote, purity of Hyangan province. And this is purity in relation to both, you know, ethnic and, and environmental, uh, the environmental character of the region. Uh, so, so the idea here was to make uh, the province into this one giant uh, grazing uh, pasture. Uh, for Mongol herders, um, and they, they of course hoped that ethnicity would map very neatly onto to environment um, in, in this place. Uh, and so they directed their energies towards, uh, quote, returning nomads um, to this, you know, what they idealize as this primeval landscape uh, through these policies of uh, what they called uh, grassland protection. Um, for, for Japanese leaders, um, the way that they describe this particular process, um, they often talked about, quote, protecting, hunting, and herding minorities. They call these minorities um, a so-called, you know, dying race, uh, horobi yuku minzoku. Uh, and um, these are very explicit references. Um, they hearkened back to the earlier experiences uh, that Japanese administrators had um, with settler colonialism uh, in the Ainu lands of Hokkaido, which I think you had a, a, a talk about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and in Inner Mongolia, uh, these administrators uh, were blaming Chinese migrant farmers uh, for chopping down the trees and stripping the steppe and then causing all of this environmental degradation. So the, so the Chinese migrants became this very um, easy scapegoat uh, for, um, for the, the Mongols and for um, the Japanese administrators. Um, so what we can see is that um, ethnicity and environment they really became conflated, right? Uh, that uh, state uh, planners saw hunting and herding as really vital markers to ethnic identity uh, for the Mongols. And so what that meant is that um, that nature, the nature from which they you know, drew their sustenance and their livelihoods, that also needed conservation, right? That um, the nature was an important part of ethnic identity as well. Um, and so, you know, there are some comparisons that we can make here to uh, the Third Reich uh, in Germany um, at the same time, which was very much involved in, um, you know, valorizing the eternal forests of the German soul. And here, you know, Japanese intellectuals really looked at um, the forests and the steppe of, of Inner Mongolia as, you know, uh, the wellspring of their own, you know, very distant ancestors um, as well. So um, as a result of all of this, uh, uh, the authorities in Manchukuo, uh, they instated a land reclamation ban uh, in Yangon province. Uh, and this, this ban prevented uh, any Chinese uh, from further reclaiming any land. So if they were already living there, um, then they had their plot of land, but they couldn't expand it any further. Um, and all of this would eventually lead to the agricultural advance slowing to this creep. Um, and new environmental boundaries uh, would grow uh, out of the province as a result. So this is, this is a map that was produced at the time showing what areas were closed to land reclamation, what areas were open. They don't neatly match onto the provincial boundaries. In fact, there's quite a bit of land reclamation even within Hyangan province that they can't really do anything about. Um, and the ideas behind uh, this particular environmental transformation of the steppe, um, they originated in experimental farm stations um, of the South uh, Manchuria Railway Company. Oops. Uh, and uh, in particular, their main station, uh, which was this place known as Gongju Ling, uh, in, uh, which was founded in 1913, also on uh, former Mongolian territory on horse and grassland. Um, so you get a sense of, you know, that these are, these are similar steppe environments. Um, and Gongju Ling uh, served as a testing ground to, to solve what um, Japanese um, agricultural experts uh, saw as a particular problem, um, both in improving uh, the quality of animals and multiplying the herds in Inner Mongolia. And that, that problem was uh, what to feed the animals on the steppe, which um, seems to be, um, you know, year by year becoming drier and more like the desert, right? 
Uh, so throughout uh, the 1920s, um, there was a livestock fodder expert at Gongju Ling, um, this man named Kosai Motokichi. I don't have an image of him, like can't figure out what he looks like. Uh, this is the level of, of local people that I have to deal with. Uh, so, so he um, was working to try to figure out what was the right plant uh, for these harsh environmental conditions? Um, what was the right plant to prevent land degradation or what he perceived as land degradation? Uh, and he identified uh, alfalfa. In Japanese, this is known as rusan, um, which is uh, from the French word lucerne. Uh, and uh, alfalfa, which is not native to Inner Mongolia, um, as the most efficient of, of these plants in terms of the amount of fodder that it could provide uh, these animals. Um, and the particular alfalfa samples at Gongju Ling, um, they also spread with settler colonialism. Uh, so they have a history of their own. Um, Japanese studied the plant. They first encountered the plant with Americans um, at experimental farm stations back in Hokkaido as they were transforming uh, the Ainu lands there. Um, and then they bought their seeds from Russians um, in Manchuria uh, in the early 20th century. And so um, the Russians were also originally in Manchuria uh, for their own purposes of imperial expansion. Um, but the really important thing is alfalfa, uh, much like soybeans, soybeans also have this quality. Um, alfalfa um, has this quality of fixing uh, nitrogen gas from the atmosphere uh, so that the element um, uh, becomes um, available for healthy plant growth. So they take nitrogen from the atmosphere and um, convert it and bring it into the soil. And so they actually fertilize the soil in this, this green fertilizer um, sort of way. Uh, and so, um, for this reason, alfalfa is touted as this really um, um, miracle plant, I suppose. Uh, for Kosai, um, Kosai thought that if you could dry alfalfa uh, as hay for the cold season, that would eliminate the need for herders to migrate out to winter pastures, right? And ultimately, he was hoping um, that herders would stop migrating completely, that this was a way to rationalize um, uh, herding um, nomads into sort of these, these settled uh, ranchers. Uh, and so um, the alfalfa uh, was this, this um, would lead the Mongolian territories towards a sustainable, like self-sufficient uh, future. Um, but it was a sedentary future. So um, this is very different from the ways in which the Mongols necessarily wanted to live their lives, right? Um, and all of this alfalfa would be used to, to feed these new um, hybrid animals. And uh, in particular, what we'll be talking about is sheep. Um, and so technicians at Gongju Ling also began importing um, and breeding uh, foreign animals um, with local ones, um, in particular uh, merino uh, uh, with the Mongolian fat-tailed uh, sheep. Uh, so the South Manchurian Railway Company uh, shipped in herds of up to 500 uh, merinos at a time um, from places like New Zealand and Australia uh, and the United States uh, to kickstart um, their, their breeding programs. And the idea here was to eventually create a hybrid sheep um, that had the soft, uh, fine wool of merino of merino sheep. All of you probably have merino sweaters. It's, it's cold up in Michigan. So, um, and they wanted to combine that with, with the ability of the hardy um, Mongolian sheep, uh, which um, uh, could withstand the cold weather of the steppe, because merino sheep are not so good about uh, cold weather. Uh, and you can really see the difference between these two sheep um, in this particular photograph. So we have the, the merino sheep here, and it's got these layers and layers of wool, right? Uh, and the Mongolian sheep, which has not so many layers of wool, but it's, it's, it's seen as this hardier animal. Um, Japanese sources describe um, Mongolian livestock across the board, um, and they denigrate them as being rather undersized, of being a degenerate condition, um, and therefore this meant that uh, Japanese needed to intervene to, quote, improve right, uh, the, the native stock through these crossbreeding programs. Um, and what we can see here from this language, of course, is that the livestock came to represent, you know, human hierarchies of the empire. So, um, the, you know, for the Japanese, the, the decline of, of native fauna on the steppe, um, it really paralleled this, this trajectory of the so-called, you know, dying race of Mongols. Um, now, in comparison, uh, merino uh, for the Japanese represented really this ideal uh, woolen uh, beast. And that is because it has this never ending supply of yarn. And I'm illustrating this with uh, the very famous example of Shrek the sheep, 
who um, hated to be shorn so much. He lived in, in New Zealand. He hated to be shorn so much that he went and hid in the caves of, of his, you know, of his farm for six years. And this is what he looked like when they finally caught him after six years. A giant puffball, right? So you can see how, you know, this is this whole concept of a never-ending supply of wool is, you know, just so uh, alluring for these agronomists um, who are working out in Inner Mongolia. Uh, so um, the Japanese experts, uh, they crossed uh, the merino rams uh, with the, the native uh, fat-tailed use um, and they cross these and their offspring for four uh, generations and it's this fourth generation uh, that they named the improved Mongolian breed um, and it yielded about three to six times more wool uh, than the original fat-tailed sheep so you can see that from this particular um, graph um, so the merino oops sorry uh, where are we okay so the merino sheep is this particular graph right here um, and the Mongol is this one right here. Um, the black part denotes the amount of Kemp. So this is very rough wool that can't be used to spin you know, fancy sweaters and military uniforms. Uh, it's really the shaded part that, um, uh, that Japanese are using. Uh, it's the, that, that's the fine wool that you want uh, for this you know, global production of, of wool. So Merino, of course, had you know, almost nothing. But the, the, fine, uh, the, the, the rough Kemp um, is really important to Mongols, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, and the Mongol Merino hybrid, um, they're able to push this up just a little bit further, uh, this fine wool, um, and push down um, the, the amount of Kemp um, that these, these sheep can have. Uh, so um, experimental ranches, uh, they bred, uh, distributed um, over 3,000 of these sheep uh, to Mongols between 1924 and 1936. Um, throughout the Japanese occupation, they continued to donate hundreds more to herders. Um, and they projected that they could raise the number of sheep uh, in uh, this part of Inner Mongolia uh, from roughly 1 million uh, to 10 million in 18 years. This is very unrealistic. Uh, and um, the hope, of course, was ultimately that the hybrid sheep would help Japan sever its own dependence uh, to Australia, which um, was where they were getting most of their wool from. Uh, so one piece of information that I'm still missing here is exactly how um, much the hybrid sheep program increased uh, the wool exports for Manchukuo. So a um, bit of research that I need to do here. So uh, like the alfalfa um, that it consumed, the hybrid sheep also threatened uh, to undermine nomadism as a form of livelihood. Um, so the native Mongolian fat-tailed sheep uh, could largely uh, survive the bitter cold with mid uh, very minimal protection. Uh, as it turns out, the hybrid sheep could not. Um, they were princess sheep. They had to be hand-fed alfalfa. Uh, they had to live in well-bedded, sheltered conditions for at least half the year. They, they couldn't stand um, the, um, the, the, the climate of Inner Mongolia. So um, basically, these Japanese farm stations, they engineered an animal that was entirely dependent on human intervention. Um, and so the consistency of the wool was, you know, um, the consistency of the wool was uh, great for this, uh, it met the demands of this global market, but it wasn't really enough for Mongols and their household economy. Um, nomads used uh, that coarse camp that I mentioned earlier uh, to, to um, create the felt walls of their garris, which you might know as, as Mongol yurts. Uh, they also ate their meat for their high fat content. So this, this hybrid sheep didn't have as much fat on it. It wasn't as tasty for those of you who are into mutton. It needs a lot of fat. Uh, and um, eventually these, these improved Mongolian breeds were there to force uh, nomads to really settle down into these fixed uh, ranch uh, settlements. Uh, so the introduction of um, alfalfa and, and merino crossbreeds meant that um, the steppe would you know, still continue to look like the steppe, right? Um, but it would transfigure the underlying ecology um, of nomadism into one of sedentary extraction for uh, the Japanese empire. So very quickly, uh, this last part. Um, thus far, so I've explained how the demarcation of Hyangan province resulted um, in creating this, this pastoral preserve, um, and that this environment was engineered in such a way um, to, to profit for uh, Japanese, uh, the Japanese Empire. Um, but now we're going to travel across the border uh, to um, the Mongolian territories that were cut out of the process, uh, out of the province, um, and look at the environmental transformation 
taking place there. Um, now, uh, like I said earlier, that the opposite process was taking place outside of uh, Pyongan province. Uh, so Chinese farmers were allowed to clear these former Mongolian territories uh, vigorously uh, to create um, the region into the so-called granary of Asia. Uh, and um, because of the, the expansive plane of this part of the, the world, um, the Japanese agronomists saw the land as really um, ideal for growing soybeans um, for an export market um, for the empire and uh, abroad. Now, um, in particular, to, to talk about this particular transformation, I'm going to focus on a county um, in the former Mongolian territories, a place known as Keshan. Um, and uh, Keshan, just to give you a sense of what kind of place it was, it's still pretty remote. Um, it supported a population of 200,000 people uh, by the 1930s, of which 19 were Mongolian and 180,000 were Chinese. And so demographically, it's very different. 90% um, of its agricultural output went to soybeans, uh, millet, and wheat. Uh, and the other thing is, um, Keshan had a South Manchuria Railway experimental farm station uh, starting um, around 1935. Uh, and so um, horticulturalists were trying to increase agricultural output uh, using these heavy machinery uh, like tractors. Um, and so they were you know, heavily invested in this intensive form of um, agriculture in the area. And so um, by the 1930s, uh, parts of Kushan had transitioned from you know, really small scale agriculture by hand into um, mass produced farming you know, by machine. Uh, and Japanese um, exported uh, soybean products from places like Koshan um, as, as a form of fertilizer uh, because, again, it has the nitrogen fixation properties like alfalfa. Uh, and they, they exported it as fertilizer, um, as oil uh, to, to Germany, uh, to Great Britain, uh, and to the Soviet Union. Um, now, all of this exportation um, meant that the minerals taken out of the soil um, by the soybeans really never made it back into Kushan, right? And this was an enormous problem uh, because unbeknownst to the Japanese um, economists who are really pushing for the agricultural development of this region, uh, the former Mongolian territories has a very specific geological profile to it. Um, and this profile was that it lacked selenium, which is a you know, mineral that you might realize, you probably never even heard of that your bodies needed selenium, but it does. It's a, it's a critical element for human bodies. Um, and um, while a high meat intake can prevent selenium deficiency, uh, Chinese homesteaders, as you can see here, uh, living in the area, uh, they tended to eat uh, very locally grown food in their backyards. Um, and this is regardless of their social class. Um, so they were uh, eating gruel or pancakes made from millet, um, tofu, daikon, cabbage, right? Um, and this contrasted with what Mongols, who used to be living in, in this area, uh, who ate a lot of meat and dairy, uh, and they, they traded for their grain um, you know, in regional markets. Uh, so the aggressive conversion of the this, this selenium deficient land into soybean farms resulted uh, in a spate of environmental disease amongst Chinese farmers. Um, and it really was this all of a sudden moment. So all of a sudden in 1936, um, people in Kushan uh, began to suffer from uh, fever and from headaches, um, dizziness and cold limbs. Um, they had a weakened pulse and chest pains and nausea. And the hallmark um, symptom of this particular illness was that uh, most people would vomit um, you know, yellow or green liquid, uh, and then they would die in two days. So it was a very fast illness, right? Um, and you know, at that, that particular outbreak of the 130 known cases in Kushan, um, 128 people uh, had died. And so um, this is a very you know, quick and devastating illness. And so Japanese observers, they had no idea what was going on. Um, and at the time, uh, they called the you know, mysterious illness Kushan disease and the name stuck. So you can look up Kushan disease online um, and you know, fuel your nightmares. <laughs> but uh, um, by 1938, so two years after this initial outbreak, um, because they have a sense of, you know, they codified many of these, these symptoms uh, medically, um, hundreds of cases were beginning to appear um, across um, the former Mongolian territories. Uh, along the border, um, we have Chinese vernacular records talking about, you know, heaps of, of bodies that were left by the outbreaks 
they talk about these, quote, bachelor villages because this illness actually had a tendency to strike women and children before men, um, streets of broken lineages, uh, these sorts of um, evocative terms that the um, Chinese settlers were using. So um, as we can see, uh, the shift from herding to farming in this region uh, cut out of um, the autonomous province, uh, we have dietary patterns that are becoming less diverse, both in terms of the content of the food and then also where the food is coming from. And um, now the food, um, you know, it was leaving in one direction from the site of extraction to other parts of the empire and beyond. Uh, and so the globalization of, of soybeans as this product um, as a result of Japanese imperialism was you know, intensifying the shortage of selenium. Uh, and in Kushan, what we can see um, is these, these larger dynamics of globalization happening on a very you know, small local scale. Now, uh, it would take another 40 years uh, since 1936 uh, to understand some of the causes of Kushan disease. Um, and we can thank the communist medical regime for being able to figure it out that it was selenium. Uh, and that, uh, of course, brought uh, selenium deficiency in this area to an end. So, what are the origins of ethnic autonomy in the People's Republic of China? Um, instead of only seeing the origins of communist rule as forged in the fires of uh, Japanese or against Japanese imperialism, um, I'm arguing for here today uh, the significance of the Japanese occupation in actually shaping the ethnic and the ecological boundaries right, of modern China. Uh, and some of these origins, of course, uh, date to very crude um, ethnic understandings uh, from the Japanese empire of what it meant to be Chinese. Right, or what it meant to be Mongolian. Um, and uh, Japanese administrators saw uh, Mongols and Chinese um, as entangled, um, in entangled ethnic and, and environmental terms. Uh, so within the borders of Yangon province, um, Japanese and Mongol administrators uh, maintained this pastoral landscape, uh, but they you know, brought in new kinds of plants and animals to persuade uh, nomadic herders into a settled you know, ranching lifestyle. Uh, and beyond uh, Hyangan province, uh, we have imperial and global pressures, uh, which compelled Chinese farmers to reclaim the land, uh, to convert it into fields of, of soybeans and grain. Uh, and so um, pastoral herding here defined uh, Mongolian ethnic identity, just as you know, sedentary agriculture defined Chinese ethnic identity. And then in turn, uh, these, these ethnic identities um, shape the environment in irrevocable and sometimes devastating ways that would continue on into uh, the post-war world. OK, so that's it for today. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. OK, yeah, that would be great. Um, so I actually work in modern China and there's a just an interesting parallel. So I study dance history mm -hmm. and the main artist, uh, Jia Zuo Guang, who's um, known for creating the early forms of Mongol dance, mm -hmm. um, was Man Manchu. Okay. And his teacher actually was Ishibaku, one okay. of the most famous Japanese modern dance pioneers who taught him in Manchuria. Right. Um, and so I think your overall story is something that we see kind of reappear in so many different areas of modern Chinese history and culture. Right. And I think now there's more and more recognition of the importance of Japanese imperial rule as sort of laying the foundations for many ways that contemporary Chinese structured right. their society and culture. Um, and it seems like in this specific case, you're showing that the, the boundary line mm -hmm. itself was sort of one of the things that lasted from that era. Mm -hmm. and so I guess I'm just also curious because you said that the idea itself of autonomy was mm -hmm. something that also came from this era. And I just, mm -hmm. I really would like to hear more about that. So not just the, the border itself, but the idea of autonomy. So you could, could you say a little bit more about that? Right. Okay. So the idea of autonomy, it is very complex and tangled up and, um, we have to take into account um, the Soviet Union, of course, um, which um, was also addressing this particular problem. Uh, what the communist Chinese who were in touch with the Soviets, um, how they um, you know, also received some of these ideas and then 
uh, reinvented them for their own purposes and of course um, where the Japanese are getting their ideas from, right? So uh, in many ways, I think sovereignty comes from all three places. Um, uh, you know, there um, is work that's done um, primarily focusing on the communist connections between the Soviets um, and the Mongols and the Chinese uh, in terms of tracing out uh, this particular story. And of course, um, the um, person that um, was uh, most, uh, you know, the, the, the standard narrative of this particular story um, has to do with uh, the figure known as Ulan Hu, which I'm sure you're aware. Um, Ulan Hu was um, a Kharijan Mongol, so he was from sort of the Southern Mongolian area. Uh, he, um, that's his, his Mongolian uh, name, but he's also known as Yunzi, uh, and his Mongolian wasn't so great, uh, and <laughs> which is fine because mine isn't so great either. But but the point is like he um, so he was heavily invested from a very early stage um, working uh, with the communists uh, to to um, you know set up this um, autonomous region. Uh, so there's that half of the story, uh, which has been written about. Uh, the part which people like Christopher Atwood have alluded to, but you know, this is sort of where he ends his two volume book, um, Young Mongols and the Interregnum Decades, um, is, is this part of the story, where um, it's really, it takes to, to, to build the autonomous region of Inner Mongolia, it takes these uh, southern uh, communist Mongols like Ulan Hu uh, to collaborate with the eastern Mongols uh, who are, um, I didn't really fully go into it in this particular talk, but the Eastern Mongols who um, have been educated under the Japanese regime uh, and come into power. And so the, the figure that's often talked about in that particular narrative is this man named Hafenga. Um, and Hafenga uh, is a really interesting figure. Um, in the standard narrative, it's, um, you know, he collaborated with the Japanese just to survive, but in his heart of hearts, he's always been this like loyal communist. Um, so that's, that's usually how his, his biography is told. Um, but of course, um, actually that wasn't quite the case. So he was working with the Japanese to put in social surveys to kind of figure out um, to what extent um, who owned the land in some of these former Mongolian territories and how to implement land reform. Uh, so he was involved in that. Uh, then in 1944, he actually becomes this cultural diplomat and is sent to Tokyo. He comes from, back from that, uh, you know, the Japanese empire falls apart. He and the Eastern Mongols and the Dower Mongols um, fin finally come together and begin to cooperate and uh, strike out this deal with, with the Southern Mongols. Uh, and then they put into place this, this Inner Mongolia Autonomous uh, Region. Um, Hafenga is a really sad story. I mean, Ulan who also kind of fell away from power as well. He rose up quite high in the ranks. Um, but Hafenga, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, his, his Japanese collaborative past comes to really, collaborationist past, com comes to really haunt him. And then he's, of course, targeted um, in the violence of the Cultural Revolution, and he, he dies. Um, so, so it's really this kind of this two-part story. And um, disentangling to what extent um, the Eastern Mongols were kind of like these, these closet or hidden communists all along, that part's really hard to um, figure out, right? And so it's really left up to, you know, the interpretation of historians to kind of to see if, you know, how long do they harbor these communist anti-Japanese um, sentiments? Um, and that's, that's hard to say, but it is, it is a much broader uh, picture. I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but no problem. Hi. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I was intrigued by the connection you made to Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I have a two-part question. Okay. And one part is, I mean, because there's so many um, manifestations right. of this um, Mongolian settlement mm -hmm. process that are reminiscent of Hokkaido. Um, are, do you see real practical connections, um, lineages, for example, back to Sap Sapporo mm -hmm. Agricultural College mm -hmm. or other, you know, through, through the kind of human network, um, colonial studies mm -hmm. at, at Tokyo University, for example. So on the one hand, practical connections. On the other hand, um, some of what you said uh, it's very thought-provoking, and it, it raises the question of how Japanese bureaucrats, technocrats, were actually imagining this in relation to Hokkaido. Because I hear, on the one hand, this concept, of course, it's a later concept of primi primitive authenticity, mm -hmm. but it's clear that they were trying to, uh, uh, you know, 
with conditions and limitations to preserve a race. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're talking about them in exactly the same way. And they're, so I should say in the first part that they're relocating them mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, in w sort of one iteration of imperial re relocations. Right. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they are, let's see, I'm losing my string here, my thread. Um, they're, on the other hand, they're talking about them as a, as a vanishing race, right. right? So I guess my question is, how do, you, how do you begin to parse out that sort of metaphor, on the metaphoric or symbolic level, how do you begin to parse out that relationship with the uh, set, set, settler colonialism in Hokkaido? Okay. Which really strove to um, annihilate a race right. or an ethnicity. Right. Tough questions. Okay, so um, with uh, the practical connections with Hokkaido, um, so there are several strands, but nothing really um, very powerful um, that, that comes out of the archives. Um, in terms of um, some of the publications that are coming out, there are connections being made between um, uh, agriculture, dry farming that's taking place in Hokkaido um, that can be easily uh, exported and transplanted in, in the North Manchurian Plain. So we see um, uh, pamphlets talking about dry farming in Hokkaido and how that could be brought to, to Manchuria. And so the technology um, and the crops that, they're th uh, that they want to use are, are being you know, transferred in that way. Uh, in terms of the actual people, I'm not um, seeing, like, I'm not seeing the same people coming from Hokkaido necessarily going to Manchuria. Um, and so there might be actually at least one generational turnover, right? Um, but, uh, you know, one of the archives that I worked out of um, was the Hokkaido Foreign, um, or sorry, the, the Hokkaido um, Northern Studies Collection, which houses a significant cache of materials. Um, so weirdly, in terms of regional archives in Japan, which houses, you know, what houses the most information on this? It's, it's Fukuoka, where lots of, you know, colonizers actually got their start from, um, and then also Hokkaido. Uh, so kind of like the two peripheral ends of Japan. Uh, and so, so the fact that Hokkaido um, University Library has these materials and they were just kind of donated there or they had them from the, you know, from, from the Sapporo, like Imperial or Hokkaido Imperial University, it seems to me that at least there is an imagining and there's a technological transfer of, 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 of what was happening in Hokkaido and how to push that frontier from Hokkaido into to Manchuria. So that connection can definitely be made. Um, in terms of metaphorically and symbolically thinking about this tension between, you know, um, vanishing or causing to disappear indigenous peoples versus preserving them, um, again, I think this has to do with a bit of the generational change that we're starting to see, right? So um, even in Hokkaido by the 1910s, we, we begin to see because, partly because of the advent of, you know, modern anthropology, right? Uh, that there's a shift in discourse about um, going from, you know, really stamping out the Ainu population into lamenting that they're dying off and that we need to preserve some of their traditions and cultures and that sort of thing. So there's a, you know, discursive shift that we're starting to see um, in the early 20th century. And so um, I think by the time we get to the 1930s, people begin to take that seriously as, as um, you know, that they saw this happen in Hokkaido and before that, that you know, under this earlier form of Japanese colonialism, that it was seen as um, a good thing to assimilate, right, Ainu, and now it's seen as not a good thing anymore. It's a marker of modernity to be able to preserve, you know, in this like very paternalistic kind of way that these sorts of people um, can continue to exist. And we see this not only um, in, of course, Manchuria, but also in, in Korea. So Taylor Atkins's uh, book, Primitive Selves, uh, which is about um, um, anthropologists studying uh, Koreans and seeing Koreans as this, you know, primitive self of the Japanese. So there's that aspect. But um, yeah, I, it, what's really interesting too is that if you look into the Chinese documents in the 1920s, um, uh, Chinese officials writing about Inner Mongolia in the 1920s before you know, the Japanese really have an entrenched presence there, 
they're also referring to Hokkaido, and they want to bring the settler colonialism of Hokkaido to Inner Mongolia. And so they, they've imagined like Hokkaido as their, their model for um, bringing in Chinese migration and um, um, to, to the region as well. So it's the, these weird um, imperial feedbacks that are happening um, and, and shifts that are taking place. I'm not sure if that fully answers it. Okay. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, Thank you. To, to go on with this discussion about imperial feedback loop, right. um, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, so I know when the Japanese government um, went into Hokkaido, mm -hmm. uh, the government hired uh, Horace Capron, yes. uh, the uh, uh, Minister of uh, Secretary of Agriculture right. from the US, and basically copied American right. policy toward Native Americans. Um, so there's this lineage, right? Yes. And but it's hard to say that um, Capron's policy was uh, trying to save Native Americans' culture right. or anything like that. So, so just because, and, and but in terms of farming mm -hmm. transformation to farming, kind of um, is very similar, almost identical. Right. So something happened between I think uh, Capron was hired in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, um, 1870s and right. Uh, so late 19th. Yeah. And then that Japanese policy toward Ainu initially was just a copy of American policy. Right. And then somehow it changed, as you mentioned. I right. think you're right. There was a revival of Ainu culture right. in the 1910s and 20s. Right. Um, so something happened, and then that came to Mongolia. Right. So, so that transformation is very fascinating. Right. And I, I think you could say a little bit more in your book. I, uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to reading more about this. The second uh, right. is going forward from this period. Yes. Um, you made a very bold claim yes. that uh, Japanese colonial policy kind of laid the foundations for right. autonomous ethnicity right. in those regions. Um, and, and again, you demonstrated that these policies existed in this period, mm -hmm. but that you know, not all the institutions and practices of mm -hmm. Imperial mm -hmm. Japan survived mm -hmm. after 1945. So I wonder if uh, you can say, I, I don't know if this is, maybe this is beyond the scope of your research, but oh, it's not. You, no, yeah, it's if you can say a little bit more about how, <laughs> how they persisted, how they survived, right. um, that sure. would also help me understand sure. your claim. Right, so um, this is the last chapter of the book that um, has to really be fully fleshed out. Uh, it was more um, speculative um, originally when I wrote it as a conclusion um, to my original research. So what are the colonial legacies to Japanese imperialism in Inner Mongolia? And we can at least see it in three ways. Um, the first one has to do with the border, which um, I explained to a certain extent here. The border largely remains the same. There are a couple of exceptions where there are you know, further adjustments that were made. Um, and the causes of those adjustments um, require further research for me this year and, and next year when I'm on sabbatical. Um, but uh, as, as many of you are probably aware, um, the archives for the People's Republic of China are incredibly closed um, and very difficult to access, if not impossible, especially when it comes to border regions. So we've got to be a little bit more creative about where we're looking for that information. So it's the border. Um, the second um, uh, legacy has to do with um, sort of the, the, the genetic legacy of the plants and animals in this region. Um, we know uh, First of all, that um, these animals didn't just go away, right? The sheep continued to breed, uh, and that the oldest and earliest uh, hybrid strain that's still being used in Mongolia or Inner Mongolia today date from this this merino experimentation that the Japanese were doing. They're not the m the most significant strain, but they're they're the oldest. So. The animals are still there. Um, what's really interesting is that in the 1950s, uh, when the Chinese, of course, are now working with the Soviets to bring um, sort of uh, these, these improved agricultural technologies to, uh, to the steppe, they begin importing uh, uh, tsugai sheep, uh, which is a kind of uh, Russian uh, sheep, to Inner Mongolia. And they begin their own crossbreeding programs as well. So the idea about the Mongolian sheep as being degenerate and not being able to produce enough like fancy wool is therefore, you know, that continues onwards. Um, and so um, there's, there's significant, you know, sheep breeding programs that uh, still exist to this day. So, so Mongolian sheep today are, you know, all, they're, they're very, they're mixed and um, hybrid species. Uh, and then the third one actually has to do with land reform, which is less environmental um, in this particular instance, but I'm more than happy to talk about it. 
1938, uh, the uh, Manchukuo government um, decided to institute land reform. Let me see if I can show you. Uh, going, sorry, I think these are other maps um, and images. But basically, um, after the demarcation in 1932, this land was no longer a part of Hyangan province, but it was still owned by the Mongolian aristocratic elite, and they had ownership uh, since the Qing period. So they still owned um, much of this land, uh, and uh, they were collecting rent from Chinese migrant farmers. Uh, and so the Japanese decided in 1938, uh, with the use of... Um, um, economists who were working for the South Manchurian Railroad who um, had this, this background in, in Marxian analysis, right? Uh, that they wanted to um, sever uh, the uh, land ownership of the Mongol elites in this region. And so this was really kind of like a, a prelude to uh, land reform that's later going to take on in the communist period. Uh, so it, it actually allows for a more gradual um, progress of, of land re uh, reform that takes place um, before um, you know, the communist um, policy in the 1950s. Uh, so this particular land reform uh, meant that the, uh, the Manchukuo government, um, they dispossessed the Mongolian arist uh, aristocracy of their land, uh, and in return that they paid them an income. And what's really interesting is the way in which they, uh, the Japanese sources describe this process. They're using the language from the Meiji Restoration uh, when the uh, daimyo um, are um, also um, basically, um, they had to give up their domains to the Meiji state, and the Meiji state also paid them an, an income as, as governors. So um, the Marxian um, analysts, um, these, these, these men who are working for the South Manchurian Railroad, that they're also seeing like the Meiji Restoration or the Meiji Revolution, um, they, they see that lens like in Inner Mongolia as well. So their hope is that they're trying to get rid of um, the Mongol aristocrats who are seen as these, these predatory um, landlords uh, who are no longer working the land and they've got these Chinese um, uh, migrant farmers working the land instead to sever that relationship and to bring Mongolia, uh, Inner Mongolia from this, this sense of um, nomadic feudalism into uh, you know, capitalist land use. Um, and then from there, um, you know, of course, uh, in the communist period, there's, there's another series of land reforms. So basically, in some ways, I would say that instead of looking at this, um, uh, the Japanese occupation period, it's not an aberration. It's not like um, suddenly um, uh, the process, um, the processes that are taking place to transform Inner Mongolia are, are, are not suddenly stopped and, you know, reversed, but actually part of this, this gradual process to incorporate uh, Inner Mongolia into later what becomes the People's Republic of China. Yeah. Other questions? This is a very long answer, but. <laughs> Thanks so much for the great talk. It's a, it's a fascinating um, project. Uh, I think I have like two quick okay. questions. Um, one is, um, so folks have been talking about um, Hokkaido mm -hmm. and Manchuria, but I was reminded of um, Japanese colonization of um, Taiwan. Taiwan, yes. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of indigenous populations, yes. really multi-ethnic. Um, so I was wondering, like, if you have any thoughts on that comparison um, between Taiwan and Manchuria and, like, you know, the colonization process or, you know, the relationship between the indigenous populations, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And the other question is, um, the breadth of your materials is really fascinating. And I work on um, transnational social movements, but I'm sort of troubling, um, you know, making a lot of materials and, mm -hmm. you know, v many kinds of materials into a coherent sort of analysis or, right. or narrative. So do you have any challenges on, on that, like, you know, how to sort of, you know, cluster the materials and then, you know, um, shape the sort of focused analyses or arguments, um, okay. if that makes sense. Okay. Um, right, comparisons with Taiwan. Uh, okay, so, so you are the last question because Barbara has stood up. Um, lucky you. Uh, so uh, comparisons with Taiwan. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, so Taiwan has... Um, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, the Japanese administrators in Taiwan um, have largely roped off um, the highland region 
uh, for Aboriginals. They've, they've um, basically put in what they called an IUCN, right? This is the, this line that they revived. Actually, the Qing had this line as well um, in, in Taiwan. So um, they revived this border line. And the idea is that the Chinese uh, settlers in Taiwan and the Japanese administrators are not going to cross that line for fear of death, right? So in the Japanese colonial imagination, I would say that um, the, the space that Taiwanese aboriginals occupy versus the space that uh, Mongol herders occupy are very different. Um, Japanese administrators, they don't want to cross the line because they've, you know, Taiwan, Taiwanese aboriginals are cast as stereotyped as being these um, primitive headhunter types. So, you know, the whole idea of, of, of getting into that region um, might mean that they're put, their, their lives are at risk, right? Um, which is, you know, a totally, you know, ridiculous notion, but there are revolts, you know, into the 1930s, like the Musha Rebellion, right? Um, where uh, Japanese are, you know, threatened with their lives, right? You don't see that in Inner Mongolia. So the, the, the pretense is that the, the Mongols and the Japanese are friends, um, they collaborate together, and this is, of course, pure fiction. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, in the colonial imaginary, uh, Mongols are not seen as, as threatening in the same kind of way as um, Taiwanese aboriginals. Um, and also, I think in the imaginary that Mongols are seen as genetically a part of, you know, this like, long Ural Altaic flow of peoples, which again, largely debunked, right? That it was such a direct connection. Um, and the Japanese don't really, you know, the administrators don't really see themselves as, you know, um, related to ancestrally to the Taiwanese. So there's, there's a lot of that rhetoric too, um, that kind of separates these two populations from each other. Um, but I do think that Taiwan, because it has, it's so, um, ethnically diverse, right? Once you get into the highland areas that, um, that there are certain problems that are, you know, similar between these two places, right? Regarding methodology. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is very tough. Um, so, and it's something that I'm still struggling with. Uh, I worked out of archives in Japan. Um, I worked out of a couple of archives in China and in Mongolia. Um, and um, the stuff that they did allow me to see, there's a really neat clean break. Um, everything after 1931, I could not see in China and at the archives. Um, and so after 1931, you're really working with published oral sources to, you know, kind of read uh, the Japanese official material, like against the grain, uh, to figure out, okay, what's really going on? Um, you know, is this voluntary or is this a forced relocation? So um, those are the ways in which I've been using these sources. Um, I think a second ago, I, yeah, here we go. Uh, in terms of Mongolian sources, in the Japanese archives, there are, I think this is the only Mongolian document I found. So the Mongolian information is really sparse. Um, I suspect there's a lot more in Inner Mongolia that the government is really not um, having open to, to, to the public. Um, but, uh, you know, Mongolian isn't really used in an official capacity. Um, by this point, and so it's it's much more vernacular, and probably at the very very local level, it's still being used. But again, like those archives aren't open. Um, but yeah, I do think environmental history. What makes it exciting? What also makes it maddening and frustrating is the fact that you have to bring these different strands together to be able to tell the story, and um, it is a challenge that I'm grappling with. But um, you know, I have folders. <laughs> I have suitcases full of documents. <laughs> You're all laughing because you have probably also experienced similar sorts of research disasters. But um, you know that's that's sort of like the fun of of of, of knitting together this this story. Um, thank you so much. This is uh, quite, quite the opportunity. Thanks. <laughs>